if that tight circle begins to break up, what do others do? Are they ready to just step into the breach and take over from the defence minister for sake of argument or the head of the FSB for sake of argument? Or as that group breaks, if it were to break, do people go, OK, this is the moment to, to bring down Putin? Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio. I'm James Hansen. And today we're talking about the latest on the war in Ukraine with Major General Rupert Jones, a regular guest here on Frontline. He was previously the UK's most senior commander in Iraq and joint-led coalition forces against ISIS in Iraq as well. Uh, Rupert Jones, always a pleasure. Welcome back. James, good to be with you. Thank you. I wanted to start by, by just getting your analysis of the Russian response to the atrocity we saw last week at the Crocus City Hall just on the outskirts of Moscow. Obviously an absolute atrocity, but the response from the Kremlin has been really interesting, how they have seemingly downplayed the fact that all Western intelligence would, would suggest it was an ISIS-K attack, and instead of pinning the blame on, on Ukraine and on the West. And I wonder to what extent you think Russia and the Kremlin actually believe that, or is this simply a cynical ploy to deflect blame? Oh, what an interesting question. You know, what do they what do they believe? What do they tell themselves they believe? It's really hard to, really hard to tell, isn't it? Um, you know, this plays right to you know Putin's vulnerabilities, um, and so when there appeared to be Western, particularly U.S. intelligence reports coming in uh, earlier in March, they were they were quite specific, and by all accounts, there have been you know indications for some time that puts uh, President Putin in quite a pickle. Because does he listen to these uh, these Western uh, intelligence uh, reports? They're coming from you know his his adversary, the, the United States. And if he does, how does how does he respond? Uh, it appears that they they kind of downplayed that intel intelligence, although we we can't know that for for sure. And we saw the the brutal uh, results. Uh, of of that, but I think it's really put it put Putin in a really difficult position. But do, do they believe the uh, fantastical uh, description of of the of where the attack came from? It's hard. It's hard to think that they genuinely do. That those at the centre of the of Putin's machine, uh, you know, they're masters of disinformation. They're masters of of deflection. And of course, it's effective, isn't it? Because you know the more different versions of truth that you you put out there, the more you deflect from what really might be uh, the truth. And so, you know, pointing everything towards Ukraine is very powerful. And we know a lot of Russians do listen to what President Putin says. So, so there'll be plenty of people who are listening to and believing his, his version. But of course, where they get a bit on. Picked is that their version changes over time. You know, the latest version I saw was that, you know, President Putin is now blaming radical Islamists, um, which is, you know, what I think the 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 British, the American, the French understanding is, and indeed, ISIS K have have claimed uh, the attack, but but he still manages to you know tag it somehow to being backed by the West, backed by backed by Ukraine as ever with no evidence back up his his claims and assertions. I want to come back to the, the Russian response in a moment, but, but there might be some people listening who are surprised that the West and Western intelligence services still share certain bits of intelligence with the Russians. Why does that still happen? Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, you know, there'll be better placed intelligence experts than I, but, but my... Uh, um, understanding is that the the kind of the international protocol is that where it is non-state threats, terrorist threats, and the like, that there is an understanding that uh, it is shared uh, internationally where it, with the country that is su subject to the threat. I'm sure there are limitations around that, uh, and of course, countries will be very careful with their sources of their intelligence. They won't want to compromise those sources, but where they can, I think it, it's kind of uh, deemed uh, appropriate diplomatic practice to to share that clearly where it is state threats you, you that that isn't the case but where it's terrorism i think it is it is the protocol the way possible you share that with with other nations 
And as you say, Rupert, the, the Kremlin line has been a bit all over the place since the attack. One of the things they alleged originally was that the attackers tried to flee into Ukraine. And what's been interesting in the last 24 hours or so is you've actually had President Lukashenko of, of Belarus, a Kremlin ally, saying they were actually going to Belarus. So contradicting what is the official Putin regime line. Absolutely. It's, lo it's lovely, isn't it? You can't you can't make this stuff up. And of course, what Lukashenko, Lukashenko is trying to do is, is claim a bit of credit because they were coming towards Belarus. And he says there was fantastic security cooperation between my forces and the Russian forces. Uh, and di and sort of didn't we do well sort of sort of narrative. Uh, but as you say, uh, runs absolutely contrary to what is coming out of Moscow. Now, if you if you kind of compare that with, if you like, uh, the number 10 Downing Street information machine that tries to control everything. Of course, not always terribly successfully, but they actually try to t control uh, the narrative, the story. You know, if that if the equivalent was happening here in London or indeed in Washington, you know, our governments would be apoplectic. It's hard to know, but 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 I suspect Putin doesn't mind so much because he knows he's dealing in untruths anyway. And it goes back to this idea that you just spread different versions of uh, disinformation. And indeed, Putin changes his his stance stance over time. Um, but it, but it, yeah, it's, it's it's quite amusing that you know Belarus that is you know very close ally uh, of of Moscow's and is putting out a, a very different line. And, and is the narrative around Ukraine having some kind of involvement, which, of course, is what the Russians allege baselessly? There's no evidence for that. But is that really for internal consumption in Russia? Is that for Putin to be able to continue to justify his special military operation to the Russian people? Yeah. And I mean, interesting that he has started you, you know, calling it a war um, uh, in in kind of recent times. Uh, but yes, I mean, I think it is primarily directed at his own population. And, you know, polling would indicate that uh, many Russians uh, believe what they're being told, particularly older Russians believe what they're told by by state sponsored media. And so it's pretty effective. Uh, they listen to Putin um, uh, for whatever reason, you know, this is a you know they haven't got that many other sources of, of of news, so I think it is primarily for domestic audience. But as I say, even by spreading it globally, as you know better than me, you know people are so suspicious now of all forms of media. Uh, people like conspiracy theories. Sometimes they don't even accept, think they're conspiracy theories. They just like they like their kind of the rumor and the gossip, and the rumor and the gossip becomes a a somebody's version of version of truth. And so Putin and the Russian machine play on that. They play on how you know, societies, Western societies, now consume information. I call it information, not news. And so there'll be plenty of people who'll be going, "Yeah, what? Why would we believe Washington? Why do we believe London?" Uh, you know. And so, you know, they they might be as likely to believe what Putin says as indeed their, their own political leadership. Is there not a really serious risk, though, for Putin? If if he is insistent that this is a Ukrainian-backed scheme, let's say, and his intelligence services are saying, no, actually, this is ISIS-K, and we need to take the ISIS-K threat more seriously, and yet he has been downplaying that, that actually he could open up a rift with his intelligence services. And if you're Vladimir Putin in the precarious position that, that, that he is in, that, that has a lot of danger. Yeah, again, I think there's, there's a number of things things in in that. Uh, you know, we always kind of assume that he's got this very tight knit group of people who've been around him for a very very long time. Whether that's you know Lavrov in the in the foreign foreign ministry, just as you know, a, among amongst others, um, and you get this sense of this kind of quite old but very tight group around around Putin. What I think we, the public, don't know, and, and maybe intelligence agencies do, and I'm, of course, out of date, uh, is the degree to which if that, if that tight circle begins to break up, what do others do? Are they ready to just step into the breach and take over from the defence minister for sake of argument or the head of the FSB for sake of argument or... 
as that group breaks, if it were to break, do people go, okay, this is the moment to, to bring down Putin? I'm sure um, uh, people inside uh, appropriate governments would would have a view on that, but clearly we're we're just spectators uh, on this, and it's it's very it's very hard to judge. You know, and there's been no evidence historically, really, of of the Putin regime crumbling from within. You know, you get optimistic views that could happen, but we've never really seen any any evidence. It just despite the the slightly peculiar coup attempt last uh, last year. I think the the other point, the other angle to your question is around what does it mean if you know if this is isis k uh and you know they have claimed responsibility uh and intelligence agencies seem to be publicly saying that yes they they have intelligence to 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 support that what does that mean for russia's genuine internal security uh isis k pose a bigger threat in in russia routinely than you know we uh, notice day to day because there's plenty of other things f- for our news to to focus on. You know there have been previous attacks. I mean in 2017, as I'm sure you're aware, attack in some onto the St Petersburg me- uh, metro, 15 dead. You know that's you know, that's that's a that's a big deal. Clearly this attack on a wholly different scale. But ISIS K, you know, are a are a pretty potent entity, kind of at the Central Asia, so Afghanistan based. But but attacks in into a number of places, not least Russia. Now, if if this is the start of something serious by ISIS K in into Russia, what does that mean for Russian security? And and critically, you know, Putin's you know his military is very very heavily committed towards Ukraine, either in Ukraine or su- supporting the Ukrainian fight. And of course, always when you're fighting abroad you leave the home front a little bit more vulnerable uh and you know question to what degree does does he now have to consider rebalancing his security assets to uh to to provide greater security in his in his towns and cities i think that'll be weighing if it's not weighing on his mind it'll be weighing on some of his Mm. his uh his team's minds a really interesting point you raise i suppose that brings us on to the latest situation with the war in ukraine what is your assessment rupert of, of where we are at the moment yeah well the last the last few days we you know we're, we've continued to see this really quite significant uh exchange of of missile strikes in 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 both directions you know kiev has been under very significant uh missile attack and as have uh other other cities and i'll kind of come back to that in in a moment you know meanwhile ukraine continues to uh be quite targeted in in what they do they claim that they hit a couple of um uh, Russian uh, landing ships uh, in recent days in in Crimea. You know what is clear is they continue to hold at considerable jeopardy uh, Russia's um, uh, fleet, and so their ability to really control uh, the coast of of, of uh, Ukraine um, uh, really really very limited. There there has been. Uh, seemingly pressure from you know slightly clumsy pressure pressure from the united states to ukraine to stop attacking russian oil infrastructure and energy infrastructure and it would appear that that is because of concerns that will have an impact on oil global oil prices which it may well do um but of course what's really behind that is the pathway to the presidential election um and you know so it's it's more about internal domestic politics than it is about what's happening uh globally and i mean interesting i i saw the same uh in the run up to the obama trump election when when trump came in, into office in 2016 when there was there was pressure from the us administration uh into iraq for prime minister Abadi to hasten his assault into Mosul, Iraq's second city, to liberate it from from ISIS, and again the pressure was coming from Washington for for um, Obama domestic 
political reasons. And again, you've got to be really careful with that. You know, that, that doesn't play well when you're a country at war as, as Iraq was, as Ukraine is today. That, that doesn't that doesn't play terribly well. I mean, how would you you mentioned that the missile strikes on on Kiev in particular in recent days? Do you think there's a correlation there with what happened last week with this concert hall attack? Is, is that the Kremlin deciding to try and use their narrative around some kind of Ukrainian involvement as a justification for a, a fresh bombardment of Kiev, or is that merely a coincidence? And, and how would you rate the, the Ukrainian air defences at the moment? Yeah, I mean, again, it, it's hard to tell, isn't it? And, and, and we are just speculating. Um, but, but you know, it, it feels as though uh, it, it, that, you know, the, these things are tied in together to some some degree. Um, are, you know, is it is it linked in with the the recent um, faux election in in Moscow? You, you know, you don't quite know the 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 kind of cause and effect in terms of, of timing. I think that's that's quite hard hard to be be sure about. Um, the in terms of Ukraine's air defence, you know, there the, the been times when they have seemingly been. Uh, bringing down a really very high percentage of Russian missiles and indeed drones. You know, from what I'm seeing, those those uh, interception statistics are lower than they have been in the past, and it would appear that that is in part because uh, Ukraine's air defences are stretched and critically they they lack uh, the ammunition uh, for it, and and that's why air defence ammunition. And indeed, air defence systems uh, remains right towards the top end of Ukraine's uh, wish list, uh, and 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 they continue to call for more um, uh, air, air defence uh, systems, and say critically uh, ammunition in the short term. I was speaking on yesterday's edition of Frontline, Sir Colonel Philip Ingram, and we were talking about whether there has been any significant operational shift since General Sierski took over as Commander-in-Chief from, from General Zelushny. And Philip Ingram was saying that, that he hasn't really seen much of a change. I don't know if you have. And actually, Philip Ingram was saying that, that maybe he might want to hear a bit more from General Sierski. What What's your reading of that? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I would agree with that. I don't think you are seeing a huge uh, change in design. Yes, to be honest, it's quite hard to see what he can do in the short term. Um, you know, I think they've gone into 2024 with a much lower level of expectation, not least publicly. You know, there's so much chat, wasn't there, in late 22 going into 23 about the spring offensive. Um, and, you know, a lot of that noise is coming from the West, not from Ukraine. But I think, you know, going to 24, you know, it's about tempering expectations. Uh, and so I think for the Ukrainian military that, that their options are more, are more limited at the moment. Um, consolidate, uh, the, the front as much, as much as they can put, put, uh, the Russians under pressure in, in depth. Um, but it's hard to see how they've got a, a big play in, in, in their back pocket. Uh, at, at the moment. So, but again, what we don't know is, and nor should we, uh, is you know, what is that? What is the big idea? Um, in in high level terms, what what are the discussions going on between the Ukrainian MOD, President Zelensky, and indeed the key nations that advise and, and support them? Not least, of course, um, you know, the United States, UK, France, France, and others. What is that? What is the big idea? Uh, is it to wait out twenty twenty four? Uh, and then try and get, go again in 2025. I don't know, but in terms of you know the commander in chief's profile, I don't think it's a bad thing just to keep a little bit quieter for now. Um, uh, you know, and there is there is uh, you know, there is, there is more evidence of Zelensky shuffling his deck uh, of his of his senior defence and security. And intelligence individuals, which is not surprising, two years in, into the war, uh, I don't think that's any indication. You know, as a metric of failure or panic or anything else. You know, look look at you know how Churchill rotated his people in in the Second World War. It, it, it is to be expected. Um, but but I think that for the commander in chief, just to keep his head down, 
um, uh, is probably not not a bad thing at the moment. There's an interesting paper that the Institute for the Study of War has just published, actually, under the headline uh, Denying Russia's Only Strategy for Success. And it, it essentially argues that the fundamentals remain strongly in Ukraine's favour because of the uh, latent and indeed um, current uh, capabilities of, of the Western nation supporting Ukraine. And that, yes, you know, it's easy to fall into this narrative that it's a bit of a stalemate and that Russia is slowly winning. But actually, that is only a narrative peddled by the Kremlin. That is purely propaganda. And actually, the fundamentals remain in Ukraine's favour. Is is that your reading of it, Rupert? Yeah, I think that's fair. I'm an Institute of Study War who, who put out fantastic. I mean, they've been a great source of open source material. You know, I mean, absolutely hats off to them. Uh, in terms of you know the the analysis they do and the and the information they they sift on behalf on on our behalfs, um, you know they, they themselves want to spread an, a a uh, a narrative of optimism, and I think that's important. Uh, but we should be clear that you know they, they, they are they are rightly doing doing that. Mm. But I think but I think despite that, I I, I would agree with them. Um, yeah, despite Ukraine slightly being on on the back foot over recent months, what have Russia got to show for it? I mean, not very much. A, a great many dead, you know, a few very minor um, tactical, um, you know, victories if you if you want to call them that. That doesn't account for very much, you know. When when the might of Russian's military is committed to to ukraine it doesn't it doesn't it, it yeah it's not exact it doesn't feel like a crushing blow doesn't feel like a big breakthrough is is on the way so i would agree with that that if if the west can remain committed and can kind of get its ducks in a row and properly commit funding and that, that funding can turn into real coherent military capability the ukrainians can can field and fight in their way not in the NATO way, not in the Americans way, not in the British way, but in their way, uh, then, you know, I think, you know, the, the, the no fight's gone out of the Ukrainians. You know, they're, they're as determined seemingly as, as, as ever they have been. So I, I you know, I, I, I remain glass half full uh, rather, than, rather than half empty and, and a bit of patience uh, might be what's needed because for reasons that were beyond Ukraine's control, the winter of 22 23 was frittered away and they didn't have the capability early enough to really hit the spring of 23 in the way that they might have wanted to who knows whether they would have achieved the breakthroughs they aspired to anyway but but the the manner in which the west supported them uh made it very difficult for them interesting phrase you you just used there about ukraine needing to fight in their way not in our way as it were can you just expand on on what you mean by that yeah, so so you know there has been, uh, you know, key Western nations who are committing considerable amounts of funds to to this fight and equipment. It also gives them, if you like, the 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 unspoken right to advise President Zelensky and, and his, his defence. Indeed, I have absolutely no doubt that Zelensky welcomes that. Uh, hugely hugely helpful to receive the advice of of you know. Uh, of other military nations but but there have been leaks uh reports to the media of uh and in intelligence leaks of western nations particularly america germany uh, but others um uh, expressing frustration with the manner in which the Ukrainians uh, have have been fighting, and I'll I'll comment on the rights and wrongs of doing that in a moment. But but you know, NATO nations would say that you need to you know follow our NATO doctrine, um, and you know break down the Russian defences, and it's about big combined arms manoeuvre. Again, go back to the spring of twenty three. There was you know this this aspiration that you know all the this armor that we'd we'd given to the Ukraine is going to form up in you know big big armored breakthroughs. Um, at, at, in the way you might see in a in a NATO textbook, Ukraine aren't that military. You know, Ukraine are, um, they come out of 
of the Soviet school of doctrine. In recent years, they've had more and more Western doctrine put on them, but they are they are in a, inevitably a hybrid, consequently. But on top of that, they are they are at war. They're at war with a increasingly conscript army using equipment that they've cobbled together from all sorts of different places that doesn't add up to a coherent capability. And the idea that you can then um, uh, conduct the totality of com- what we call combined arms manoeuvre, we bring all the orchestra of war together, infantry, tanks, engineers, planes, you know, all the things you, all the things you need, uh, electronic warfare in time and space. That is incredibly difficult. And we, meanwhile, in Britain, are very proud of training uh, Ukrainian soldiers on sort of plane, rightly. But let's not kid ourselves. We're giving them some pretty basic training, how to shoot straight, how to stay alive, how to apply first aid, how to do basic fire maneuver. That is a million miles off the combined arms maneuver at large scale that, that I'm talking about that NATO doctrine would, would refer to. So Ukraine are fighting their way within their equipment limitations, within their skills. They're desperately trying to avoid suffering too many casualties. So they're trying to fight in quite a cautious way. Uh, so so there is, if you like, a, a little bit of a tension. Now, A quick comment, if I may, in terms of whether or not it is appropriate for Western nations to be making those sort of comments. I would say absolutely not. And and I base that on lived experience. So, again, I go back to to Iraq and Syria when we were were defeating ISIS there, particularly in Iraq, where we were supporting Prime Minister Abadi and his Iraqi security forces. We worked behind the scenes. We were on the on the front line advising and supporting and en- enabling him in a much more active way uh, than is happening in, in Ukraine. But we always advised with what I call the local grain. So the Iraqis had a certain way of fighting, and our job was to, to optimize their way of fighting, not try and turn them into some American military. And we would always advise and guide their senior leadership, their generals and indeed Prime Minister Abadi, privately and behind the scenes. And we had, to, if we had tough conversations to have, we had them privately. In public, we always backed the Iraqis and their method and we bought them, bought them time. And then, then harder conversations behind the scenes. So I, I think a little, there's a little bit of a little discipline. Uh, coming out of some uh, capitals, and I think that's unhelpful, unhelpful for the Ukrainians. Sorry, long answer, but it's quite a quite a complicated issue. No, that's really interesting. And, and and just to be clear, you you do think at the moment there is a danger that, that that some in the West are applying a certain pressure on Ukraine to fight in a certain way, which you think is is clearly the wrong strategy. Yeah, I mean, that was certainly the case in call it the second half of of 2023 when the spring offensive didn't you know didn't leap into action. Uh, you know, there, there was certainly plenty of um, media reports, seeming leaked intelligence uh, reports that that would uh, point you point you uh, in that direction. And again, you know, slightly distasteful. You know, if I, if I was a Ukrainian, I'd be going, okay, thanks a lot, friends, because you're you're part of the reason we're not fighting. Uh, in a more holistic manner, if I can call it that, because you, because you allowed the months to fritter, you know, deciding whether or not you were going to deign to give us tanks for for the fight. Um, so yeah, it, it, th- those sort of leaks have gone quieter. Hopefully, you know, NATO and others have just said, you know, just settle down the conversation. These these conversations are best had in private. Um, but ultimately, it's the Ukrainians who are fighting and dying. It is not Americans. It's not British. It's not French. And, and they must fight in a way that feels comfortable for them and where they think they can sustain their their industry, their population, their military into the long term. We're two years in already. And, and who knows how much longer they've got to keep it going. Major General Rupert Jones, always appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us today on Frontline. An absolute pleasure. Thank you, James. Thank you for watching Frontline for Times Radio. For more, click subscribe on our YouTube channel. You can listen to Times Radio and you can read more about the war in Ukraine and global security with your Times digital subscription.